I just can't help myself. I'll just sit in bed and just be like, just picking out the little wood chips. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Brain Blaze. I, as always, I'm your host Simon. Welcome, welcome in this show. Danny writes me a script that I've never read before. We're going to react to it. The surprisingly dark original purpose of everyday inventions. Okay. <laughs> the original purpose of the knife. For stabbing people and now spreading butter. I don't know. Look, Danny's got it covered. Let's go. Spring vacation. What spring vacation? Is this a thing? Is this like maybe for school, like spring? But we'd call it Easter vacation. I can remember there were certain old toys and games that stood the test of time and kept on getting dragged out of my toy box to enchant and entertain me throughout my childhood years. The Etch-A-Sketch, the, uh, the Space Hopper, Tommy Tronic 3D Shark Attack, Hot Wheels Fat Daddy Sizzlers, the Fisher-Price Cash Register. Danny, you had different toys to me. I did have an Etch-A-Sketch. Is the space hopper the thing you bounce on? I didn't have one of those, but I was familiar with it. I probably wanted one. The others I don't know. I had some Hot Wheels, but I don't know that specific brand. This is all very fascinating, Simon. Thanks for so, so much for sharing this information. It's why we're here. Let's move on. But in other cases, the novelty wore off surprisingly and tragically quickly. I know that the slinky toy holds a special place in the heart of millions, and more mature viewers may even remember the catchy jingle that appeared in TV commercials for decades. What walks downstairs alone or in pairs and makes a slinkity sound? A spring, a spring, a marvelous thing. Everybody knows it's slinky. It's slinky for fun. It's a wonderful toy. It's fun for a girl and a boy cringe and also no i'm not that old well for me the fun lasted about five minutes yeah i had a slinky i mean it's it, that it, it's cool and then it's done yes it was quite amazing when i first saw those shimmering gravity to high metal spirals walk down the stairs on their own as if possessed by the soul of a demonic toy maker it was quite good the second time around too but after that i'd had enough and went back to drawing hairy genitals on my etch a sketch maybe i'd have been more impressed if the american naval engineer richard james managed to crack his original idea for the invention back in 1943. During the Second World War, Richard had put his mind to developing a new tension spring that would keep crucial navigation equipment steady when a battleship was rocking about all over the place during choppy conditions at sea. Richard was apparently, whenever someone's called Richard, I just automatically want to call them dick. This doesn't surprise me. Before we continue today's video, an incredible announcement. This video is sponsored by our longtime friends over at Squarespace. Squarespace is the ultimate platform that allows you to make a stunning website and succeed in whatever you're doing online. I mean, that's not a guarantee, but a Squarespace website is, you know, it looks professional. It makes you look like you know what you're doing. And this is all thanks to a beautiful new feature that they have called Fluid Engine, which is a reimagined drag and drop system. They call it a next generation website designer, which I think is absolutely apt. It's like having a team of designers. You're just like, yeah, put that there, put that there. Except it doesn't get sent off to some incredibly expensive designer somewhere. It's just like, done easy boom your website is made you start with a template you use fluid engine you customize it you add whatever you want and and you're good to go plus an amazing feature of squarespace is their extensions squarespace extensions which are vetted extensions so you know there's nothing dodgy going on and they allow you to expand your website's functionality marketing tools advanced analytics all of this stuff is uh, just allows you to make a better website that is perfect for whatever you want to do online look there's also Squarespace email campaigns. It's a powerful tool to drive sales and engage your audience. You collect email subscribers on your website, and then you're like, hello, friends, you showed interest in this. Would you like to buy this? Would you like to do that? And you send an email, and that's a very powerful way to drive sales and, uh, well, obviously, grow your business, isn't it? So, look, when you're ready to take your presence online to the next level, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, save 10% of your first purchase of a website or a domain at squarespace.com slash blaze and use my promo code blaze. You know what that also helps do? Helps support this show, bringing you more blazes constantly and all the time. I mean two to three times a week but you know what i'm getting at join squarespace today there's a link below and now back to today's video he was apparently making reasonable progress as he messed around with the coiled springs but then he clumsily knocked one of his springs off from a shelf he watched in amazement as instead of falling down to the floor with a noisy clatter the spring slowly uncoiled and walked itself down from the shelf right across the desk and then elegantly strolled down to the floor richard was so excited that he tried again straight away and maybe the third time fifth time i bet he was already bored he later explained quote strictly speaking i didn't invent the slinky he practically walked into my life 
also an expert at dad jokes, apparently. And it was around this time that he forgot there was supposed to be a war on and spent the next year designing a machine which could coil 80 feet of steel wire into a two-inch spiral toy for children, assuming there would be any children left after the bomb stopped dropping. Holy shit, Dark Danny. Listen, he can if he wants to do this, let him, let him just make his little invention. He's probably going to make a fortune, isn't he? I'm pretty sure he does, because I'm pretty sure I know this story from making a video about it previously. Richard and wife Betty borrowed $500 to get the slinky toy into production, but it has to be said that it was hardly a runaway success, largely because a boxed spring didn't look particularly exciting on shelves of the toy store. It was only when Richard got a chance to put on an in-store demonstration of the slinky in a branch of Gimbal's in 1943 that the slinky finally began to spring into life as the store shifted all of their 400 units in just 90 minutes. Unfortunately, Richard had lost the plot by the time we get to 1960. Although the company was making a stack of fat cash, he would insist to his family that money meant nothing to him, often tearing up wads of cash in front of them to prove his point, promptly causing Bretty and their daughters to secretly pick it up later and tape it back together. Sounds like he's just got a little bit mad. <laughs> mad with money. When he wasn't tearing up money, he was giving it away to an evangelical Christian sect. And by 1960, Richard had taken the decision to leave his wife and children and run away to Bolivia to serve as a missionary for what was essentially a nutty religious cult. Holy shit, he lost the plot, didn't he? <laughs> it's alright, he invented the slinky and now he's living in Bolivia. <laughs> what happened to you, man? He was kind enough to leave the business in the hands of Betty, but it was now close to bankruptcy as Richard had been giving away all the profits to the servants of God. All credit to Betty, she managed to thrash out deals with creditors and turn the company around. Whilst Richard James may have been the accidental inventor, Betty James was the one who steered the company through the next 40 years of glorious triumph, even commissioning that famous marketing jingle that the world would see heavy rotation on the TV for decades to follow. Over 300 million slinkies have now been sold and it's still a big seller today. To be fair, you can't really say that about... Tommy Tronic 3D shark attack, so well, what do I know about anything? Now I kind of want to buy a slinky for my kids. They'd probably be amazed by this. I'd be like, look at this, look at this. Whoosh, whoosh, and they'd be like, holy sh dad. <laughs> and then the fifth time they'd be like, cool, can we go back to drawing pictures? They love drawing pictures lately. So many pictures. And they do those, it's those drawings, you know, now where it's like it's just the head and then the arms and the legs come out the head. <laughs> and it's like, what the f is this? Where's the body? And it's like, that's how kids draw people. And I'm like, who's that? And it's like, that's dad. And I'm like, where's his hair? And she's like, you don't have hair, dad. And I'm like, oh, no, I was just testing you. And it turns out there's more to Slinky than just strolling down the stairs five times. During the Vietnam War, US soldiers would use a Slinky as a makeshift jungle radio antenna by clipping one end onto their radio equipment and slinging the rest of it up into the trees for an instant boosted signal. That's cool. And as Sam should be showing us now, a Slinky also makes an excellent and highly comical squirrel deterrent for bird feeders. What? Sam, show it, and I'll watch this afterwards. But I'm still not entirely convinced that Richard James should have turned his back on the Allied battleships who were still struggling to keep their nautical equipment steady whilst he just pratted about with a toy. It's a good job Slinky didn't lose the war. Out of touch. Considering that the Kellogg Company has now been selling breakfast cereals all over the world for a century and have reported 128 bowls of Kellogg's cornflakes are still eaten every year, you'd think that the original cornflake inventor, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, would have felt proud of this amazing legacy. Oh no, he doesn't. Spoiler alert, he invented this so people would stop having a wank. <laughs> it's true, it's true, as you'll soon see. Dude, oh, that's disgusting! You ruined my day! I'm telling the boss! But you'd be dead wrong. The Kellogg Company went against everything he believed in, and he wasn't even the Kellogg who launched it. But can it be true that Dr. John originally invented cornflakes to stop sinful masturbation? While some people reckon so, others claim that the theory is completely false. What? Yet I feel the answer lies somewhere kind of in between. Well, it was to stop, like, urges, wasn't it? That's what he described it as, and everyone was like, yeah, well, urges mean just having a wank, don't they? Let's find out. The story of the Kellogg Company is a complex tale of two feuding brothers, which probably deserves a brain blaze of its own. If we condense the tale to a crunchy nut bite, it begins with the Michigan man, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, who was a medical doctor, a health reformer, a supporter of eugenics. Of course he was, it was the past, and a devout Seventh-day Adventist. Probably not the guy with whom you'd want to enjoy a pint. He wouldn't drink one anyway, as that's bad for you. He also ran an unconventional health institute on the side in the 1870s, later inviting his younger brother Will to help out with a man 
management. They dabbled in hydrotherapy, electrotherapy, cold air cures, and most significantly, diet. Dr. John was of the firm belief that stimulating food and drinks were destroying the minds and digestive systems of the American citizen, and he was a strong advocate of consuming bland, horrible crap instead. That sounds horrible. Food is one of life's few joys. Why do you have to take it from us, Kellogg? Why, you bastard? So he was delighted when he accidentally invented cornflakes in 1896. Yeah, cornflakes suck. Regular cornflakes are just like boring, bland-tasting food. What we've managed to do, and I used to like them a lot more. I used to love crunchy nut cornflakes. Do you have those in America? They're like cornflakes but they got like they're like honey covered and they got little nuts on them and they're outrageously delicious until as a kid someone pointed out mm, they kind of taste like cardboard a little bit don't they and then i couldn't enjoy them anymore you asshole there's also frosties frosted flakes which are like the ones for kids with sugar on delicious also that's nice um yeah but regular cornflakes they're only good that you get like sugar and pour them or pour it all over them otherwise it's like what's the point fucking dr kellogg you c Thank you so much. The story goes that he got called out urgently from the institute one night and left a batch of wheat berry dough on the table overnight. When he returned the following morning, he was tempted to chuck the moldy old dough in the bin, but then he hit upon the idea of running it through the rollers instead. This produced delicate little flakes which could be baked and passed around to the lucky guests of the health institute, who would probably have killed one of those new hot dogs by this point. It's worth noting that these early cornflakes were nothing like the type that you'd later find in a packet of cereal. They contained no sugar or additional flavorings and were so hard that they could break your teeth. Still, younger brother Will got a whiff of a business opportunity brewing here, although he had his work cut out as his sniffy older brother always stated that he was not really interested in business. Well, that's why you brought on your brother to handle management, isn't it, big brain? He was far more interested in spearheading a genuine health reform. However, the two Kellogg brothers did briefly collaborate on a new business which produced whole grain cereals, but they soon fell out over sugar. Dr. John was of the opinion that their whole grain cereals should remain bland and pure and healthy, whilst Will was of the opinion that the addition of a bit of sugar might actually encourage customers to buy some of this shit. They couldn't resolve this stalemate, so Will just buggered off and produced his own sugary cornflakes, which would eventually shift vast quantities under the banner of the Kellogg Company. Dr. John got a bit upset about this and tried unsuccessfully to sue Little Will over the use of the family name, but it was Dr. John who would be denied the legal right to use his own surname for his own rival version of his own invention. Yeah, I mean... No, I mean, yeah, you, you put them through a roller and you made this stuff. You didn't patent it. You didn't do anything like that. You just, like, you came up with a recipe. And then your brother comes along and is like, cool, I'm going to sell this recipe. And he and it's his name as well. So, honestly, Dr. John, you can fuck right off, can't you, mate? Not that anybody was buying his sugar-free sadness anyway. Now to the anti-masturbation thing. It's true to say that preventing masturbation was not on Will's mind when he launched his own version of the cereal that would become Kellogg's Corn Flakes. They were never promoted as the anti-masturbatory morning meal, and you couldn't send off for a free chastity belt after you'd saved up enough tokens. But that's missing the point that this kind of thing was very much on inventor Dr. John Kellogg's mind when he was developing the plain bland diet as a whole, a diet in which his Corn Flakes became the most famous ingredient. Whilst Dr. John was keen to dissuade Americans from gorging on meat, potatoes, cake, and the artificial foods that were breaking down the human gastric machine. He also had clear views on masturbation, to which he devoted an entire chapter of his book in 1887. Okay, he was actually against sexual activity or contact of any kind. Oh, dude, what are you? <laughs> That's what humans do even amongst married couples, aside from the troublesome business of procreation. Bro, you are absolute mega buzzkill. No wonder you don't have any friends. I'm just assuming you don't have any friends. Maybe you had some friends who also believed this stuff, and I bet hanging out with them was a riot. What if I want to have sex before I get married? Well, I guess you just have to be prepared to die. But he had particular contempt for self-pleasuring, which he described as the most dangerous of all sexual abuses. Well, in that case, let me tell you that your repertoire and knowledge of sexual abuses is not very big. It's really not. There's, it, go, it gets a lot worse. Maybe you could watch my show The Casual Criminalist, and you can see just how f***ing bad it gets. Because it's not it's not having a wank. In order to curb your dangerous sexual excesses, Dr. John advised readers to avoid wine, beer, tea, coffee, meat, bread, cakes, condiments, and tobacco. Bro, what the f*** are we supposed to do if we can't have these things? What the f***? What the f***? You're just taking away literally all of life's joys. You dick. Did you put meat in there as well? You cock. I hate you. I hate you, Dr. John. You bellend. You. You're tacky and I hate you. As these are all notorious stimulators of those wicked sexual organs. Yeah, nothing like having a smoke. <laughs> 
sexy. Instead, he advocated the consumption of the simplest and plainest foods that you can get your sticky hands on, utterly devoid of taste or stimulation. And had he invented them by that point, I'm pretty sure his original cornflakes would have come first on his list of recommendations. Rusty Cage. You can apparently find a can of WD-40. Is that is that a reference to Rusty Cage? <laughs> is it the YouTuber Rusty Cage? Okay, let's go. Danny, you know Rusty Cage? He's recently built a fucking guillotine because he's kind of mental. He made a video about me. <laughs> Which is just like, it's just so random. <laughs> it's just a video called like The Fall of Simon Whistler. It has many views and it's just like talking about my downfall. And I'm like, I had a downfall. <laughs> and I know it's all in good jest, but I was like, okay. He's, he's, it's very funny. He's generally very funny. <laughs> Simon Whistler, Simon Whistler, how the mighty do fall. Oh, it surprised me a little. I thought the figure would be close to 99%, 99% or what? WD-40, 80% homes. Yeah, everyone's got WD-40. Why wouldn't you have a can of WD-40? As Tim Nyberg, one half of the comic duo The Duct Tape Brothers, puts it, you only need two tools in life, duct tape and WD-40. If it's not stuck and it's supposed to be, duct tape it. If it's stuck and it's not supposed to be, WD-40 it. This man's the next Aristotle. Although many of us probably just use the super lube spray to fix squeaky hinges and loosen up rusty screws, the official WD website lists no less than 2,000 official uses for the product. Running through the list right now, I can't help feeling that they're cheating a little bit. The list includes lubricates oven door, lubricates slide out attic ladders, lubricates well crank handle, lubricates inside of an old stapler. You could just say, you, uh, just come up with a million items and say it lubricates them. Not that hard. Lubricates your. Hmm. I'm surprised that they didn't go on to specify that it lubricates red staplers, yellow staplers, green staplers, Daytona beach staplers, yes. Perhaps surprisingly, the official website makes no mention of the fact that WD-40 can also be used for preventing rust on intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I say that's strange because that was once the product's sole purpose. Oh, when you're dealing with nuclear missiles, the last thing you want to see on them is rust. The worst case scenario is that the rust could cause the missiles to veer wildly off course and accidentally destroy the wrong target. And quite aside from anything else, it would look embarrassingly unsightly when you're conducting a guided tour of the silo. In 1953, a small San Diego outfit by the name of Rocket Chemical Company got to work on creating a formula to remove any water from the outer skin of SM-65 Atlas missiles and keep them all free from corrosion and looking sharp. There's some disagreement over who exactly came up with the winning formula of WD-40, but we do know that the rocket chemical company founder Norm Larson only really began to think about other potential uses for the new invention when he discovered that employees were sneaking the stuff out of the factory and taking it home. They'd figured out that WD-40 could be deployed for all kinds of useful stuff. They'd use it for lubricating oven doors, well crank handles, slide out attic ladders, and the insides of old staplers even pink staplers. Instead of firing them all for this workplace theft, Norm was instead inspired in 1960 to put WD-40 in cans and sell it to the public, which of course was a pretty shrewd business move. Seeing as the Rocket Chemical Company never really came up with anything else, they renamed their company after their sole product in 1969. And if you're wondering why they went with the name WD-40 in the first place, I'm not, because I know it stands for Water Displacement Number 40. And now, here's that man with a head just crammed full of knowledge, Mr. Know-it-all. This was just based on the scribbled notes made by the chemist after it hit upon the winning formula. Water displacement, 40th attempt, and you can call me Big Brain right now. I was wondering why they always call me Fathead. Our one interesting point is that the WD-40 company never bothered to patent the invention, as that would have involved revealing the super-secret formula, the original copy of which is still locked away in a bank vault in San Diego. Whilst this obviously meant that crafty copycat competitors could have a crack at creating their own comparable concoctions, nobody yet seems to have matched the original power of the original formula created for nuclear missiles over 70 years ago. Even if WD-40 had never evolved into a household product, I'd like to think that the marketing team could have still fleshed out the list of original uses if they'd tried hard enough. Prevents rusting of grey nuclear missiles, prevents rusting of crusted green nuclear missiles, etc. The boys in the bubble. There are odd moments in history when somebody invents something amazing that is destined to change the world forever, yet it takes them a surprisingly long time to suss out what they've invented and exactly what you're supposed to do with it. Take this final entry in today's video, bubble wrap. Yes, some people seem to consider bubble wrap to be the ultimate de-stressing accessory, but more importantly, it completely revolutionized the shipping industry, which previously just wrapped everything up in yesterday's tatty newspaper in a feeble attempt to avoid the problem of customers receiving boxes of broken fragments and despair. But that wasn't really on the minds of the inventors back in 1957. In fact, I'm not sure that American engineer Alfred Fielding and Swiss inventor Mark 
Chavon really knew what they were doing at all when they were mucking about in Alfred's garage in Hawthorne, New Jersey. While they did have one particular idea in mind to begin with, they wanted to create 3D textured wallpaper for hipsters. <laughs> oh my god. That would last about five minutes in my house. Not because of my kids. I'll just be up there like... And they'd be like, we need new wallpaper again i used to have do you remember it was it was back in the day there'd be something called wood chip wallpaper which is kind of this weird bubbly textured wallpaper with and it was just filled with little wood chips and i had this in my bedroom as a kid and i would pick that i'll just be like picking out those wood chips all the time my parents got upset they'd be like do you have to pick the newspaper the wallpaper it looks terrible and i'd be like i just can't help myself i'll just sit in bed and just be like just picking out the little wood chips Oh my god! Oh my god! I have a disease, alright? I need help! Alfred and Mark shoved a few shower curtains through a heat sealing machine to create a cool layer of trapped air bubbles, but this was clearly never going to work as 3D wallpaper, not even for hipsters. And after you've held your first subsequent house party, every single one of those bubbles is going to get popped, and your house is just going to look a bit sh. Even though they still weren't sure what to do with their new invention, it didn't stop Alfred and Mark from launching the Sealed Air Company in 1960. They later had an idea that their product could be sold as effective greenhouse insulation, but that didn't really grow into a fruitful strategy either. At least they could sit around in the office all day and pop their own bubbles to de-stress themselves as they tried to figure out what they were going to do with all of this sealed air. The very next year, it was their marketing manager, Frederick W. Bowers, who got excited when an idea popped into his head. IBM had just launched the 1401 unit, one of the world's first mass-produced computers, but it that IBM were having trouble adequately protecting these expensive new bits of kit during transit. Frederick suddenly realized that the company he worked for was actually producing little airbags, and he managed to persuade IBM that all their future products should be wrapped up and protected in this 3D textured wallpaper for hipsters. This is incredible. That is such a big brain idea. IBM agreed to put the first big order for the newly christened bubble wrap, and Alfred and Mark finally figured out what it was that they'd invented four years earlier. Whilst bubble wrap may not boast as many as 2,000 official uses, it can still be used in fairly enterprising ways. For example, it apparently makes an effective burglar deterrent. Next time you're planning on going away, stuff loads of bubble wrap underneath your doormat. If a burglar attempts a break in under the veil of moonlight, he'll be so freaked out by the random popping noises coming from underneath his coming from underneath his feet, he'll run away faster than a slinky going back to its box. Will he? Or will he just be like, oh, better not step there? <laughs> and then he'll rob the shit out of your house. I don't know. That's where we end today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Because, spoiler alert, he invented this so people would stop having a wank. <laughs> it's true, it's true, as you'll soon see.